George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, born in 1770, passed away in 1831, is undoubtedly one of the hardest philosophers to read and to understand in the modern period. This is not only because his ideas are extremely hard to follow, but also in my opinion because, well, I think he happens to be not a very organized writer. But I think reading him is tremendously fruitful and rewarding because in Hegel you find a system which uh, integrates what we know about the natural world with what we know about history and the development of philosophy. So it's a very holistic kind of system, a phenomenal system of philosophy in my view, which tries to integrate almost everything that we know into a single, single set of ideas. So in the scale and scope of its ambition, it is really quite something else. And I think it would be impossible for us to understand 20th century or late 19th century philosophy without understanding Hegel. Not only is it very difficult to understand, let's say, someone like Karl Marx without having some knowledge of Hegel, but even beyond that, it is difficult to understand people like Jean-Paul Sartre, it is difficult to understand existentialism or postmodernism or Simone de Beauvoir without knowing something about George Frederick Hegel. So he was born in Stuttgart and he was trained to become a priest, uh, but instead became a professor at Jena and then Heidelberg and finally in Berlin. His famous works include The Phenomenology of Mind, which was originally written and published in 1807, which is an account of the evolution of consciousness from sense perception all the way to absolute knowledge. His other great work includes uh, The Science of Logic, which is in three volumes, uh, first published in 1812, then 1813, 1816 and so on. And in this, he looks at uh, the logical and metaphysical core of uh, Hegelian dialectical philosophy. Finally, we have his Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, published in 1816, which is a summary of his entire philosophical system. But let me also mention Elements of Philosophy, published in 1820, Elements of Philosophy of Right, which is really his political philosophy. And that's what people tend generally to be most interested in. Now, to understand Hegel, I think we need a little bit of context in Greek philosophy because if you know nothing else about Hegel, I'm sure you are aware that Hegel wanted to utilize dialectics to explain everything, every form of transformation, every form of change. In other words, the crux of the Hegelian system is to understand knowledge as continuously evolving, knowledge as dialectical motion. And the great fathers of dialectical thought are to be found in ancient Egypt. But till Hegel came about, dialectics was mainly a method of argument. The great founder of dialectics, of course, is um, Socrates, but dialectics is also mentioned earlier by Heraclitus and by many others. In fact, all of the great Greek philosophers are, in a certain sense, dialecticians. But with Hegel, dialectics is transformed because Hegel wants to utilize uh, the idea that things develop through contradictions, not only for to understand philosophy better, not only to understand the truth, as Socrates would have it, but as a process through which thought, nature, history, everything develops. So dialectics are above all and all else the laws of change. So in his works, The Science of Logic, which is of course in several volumes, Hegel explains the dialectic. The first part of the dialectic is what Hegel calls in itself. Uh, we have translated that and made it simple for people by calling it the thesis. Uh, then secondly comes out of itself, which is the antithesis. So there's something that is in itself and something that is the negation, the opposite of whatever is in itself and that is out of itself. And finally, the synthesis is something that is both in and for itself. So we find that uh, what was in itself and what was out of itself gives rise to something new and that is the synthesis. And so now he takes these three ideas uh, in itself, out of itself and in and for itself and he wants to divide all thought, all philosophy along these particular lines. So Hegel says that the study of logic is really the study of the dialectic in itself. The study of nature is the study of the dialectic out of itself, the negation of in itself. And finally, the study of philosophy is to understand the synthesis in and for itself. 
the synthesis between logic and nature. So let's begin with the first instant, logic, that is um, the dialectic in itself. Now Socrates, Plato and Aristotle are the three great founders of Greek philosophy. Let's begin with Plato. Plato thought that everything that we see in the world, in the material world, has a peculiar or particular essence and that essence is stable, whereas the thing that we look at, the material thing that we're looking at, is always in motion. But a chair is only a chair when certain essential properties are present in an object. Or a horse is only a horse when certain essential properties are seen to be present in that particular material horse, although horses differ from each other. Horses live and die. The materials that make up all the different objects change. But the form through which we identify a horse from a donkey and a donkey from a dog always remains the same. And that is the essence of a dog or any category, any concept, or a chair or a table or a horse. And this is in, the, in a transcendental or a metaphysical realm somewhere. So hence, these essences are always stable. The idea of a chair doesn't change, even though chairs themselves may be made or destroyed or change, etc. And for Plato, therefore, the dialectic was the deductive process method, the thought process, through which we could arrive at these particular essences, understand what those essences were, and understand the relationship between various essences that build together, you know, so there are lots of things that come under one broader category. For example, chairs and tables come under the category of furniture. Dogs and horses come under the category of animals. Both these things come under the category of things, etc. Right? So we continuously move upwards into broader and broader categories. And the highest category, of course, was the good perfection, one. And it was through that that everything else in the dialectic basically emanated. So uh, Plato didn't put it that way. He didn't put it in terms of emanation, but uh, so it was taken forward in that particular light and became very, very influential in the form of Neoplatonism, also in the history of Islam. Aristotle, on the other hand, stood Plato on his head and he says that the essences of a given object could not be in a metaphysical realm, but were to be found within the object. They were there as material manifestations, the form that that, that particular object takes, but within the object. Uh, and knowledge for Aristotle was always going to be the correct categorization of these particular essences. So both were, in a certain sense, essentialist philosophers, though for Plato, essences were in the metaphysical realm, whereas for Aristotle, they were, to, they were there in the physical objects, the actual material objects that we were observing. Aristotle also took the ideas of Plato, who of course had taken the ideas of Socrates, and derived from them the laws of logic, of logical thinking. You may remember from some of my lectures or from other places where you, you may have heard that Socrates was very fond of arguing with people and finding the internal contradictions in the arguments of other people. It is from the Socratic dialogues of Plato that Aristotle derives the laws of logic. There are three laws of logic, but all of them really, the other two really are derived from the first one. And the first is the law of identity. A is equal to A. A table is equal to a table. Now that is essentially a tautology. But from that we can also understand that if A is equal to A, if a table is a table, then a table cannot be a chair. That's the law of non-contradiction. Contradictory propositions cannot be true, said Aristotle. And thirdly, Aristotle came up with the law of excluded middle. For any proposition, either that proposition is true or its negation is true. If I say it is not daytime outside, then the opposite of that must be true, that it must be night out, right? It must be nighttime outside. Or if I say that it is nighttime outside and that is shown to be false, or either it can be false or it can be true. That's the law of the excluded middle. It's not to be confused with the fallacy of the excluded middle, in which, which is also called a false dichotomy. So anyway, these were the three laws of logic as derived by uh, Aristotle from the works of Socrates, well, mainly of Plato, who, of course, was inspired by the, Socrates never wrote anything, but was inspired by the 
dialogues, discussions of Socrates. Now Hegel wants to take these particular uh, laws of logic and he wants to problematize them. He wants first of all and foremost to argue the case that uh, the idea that A is equal to A is also actually not true. He considers logic as metaphysics. Why? Not in the sense, uh, not entirely in the sense that uh, Plato thought of essences being in a metaphysical realm, but in the sense that logic deals with concepts robbed entirely of any empirical content. We're not looking at, when we're talking about logic, we are not talking about actual objects, we're talking about the laws of logic as being abstracted from the things on which they can be applied. So the only thing that can be said about something that is without any empirical content, says Hegel, is that it exists. Otherwise, what can, we see, what can we say about it? We can't say, we can't talk about its properties because that would remove us from the realm of logic and move us into the realm of the empirical sciences. We'd be looking at things for the properties that they have, but we're not concerned with properties of individual things because we are looking at the laws of logic, which are is at the most abstract level, which would be applicable to things of various properties and all properties essentially. So the only thing that we can say when we are examining things in the category of logic is that they exist. That's what we call being. Being means something that exists in the material real sense. But what can we say about being? Well, according to Aristotle's law of identity, being equals being. The, what we can say about being is that there is such a thing as being. Being is something that exists. But Hegel argues that even being is not a stat static concept. Even being is, to use some modern lingo, problem problematic. Because being automatically always implies its negation, its opposite, that is nothing. We are talking conceptually here. If I accept the concept of being, I must simultaneously accept that there is such a concept such that we can call non-being because or nothingness because the concept of being cannot exist without the concept, its opposite negative uh, concept, that is the concept of nothingness. In fact, Hegel argues uh, that every concept uh, is always, always implies, always invokes its opposite. Concepts, in fact, are created in oppositions. The, when we say define this term, when we say offer a good definition, the the, the very etymology of the word definition means to say where one thing ends and another thing begins. That's the limit, that's the boundary, that's what defines what is day versus what is not day, that is what is night, what is life versus what is death, etc, etc. So you might think Hegel is being a bit uh, naive, he's being a bit binary, but you'll see that that's not what he's actually implying at all. But what he is saying is that one concept cannot exist without its negation also conceptually existing. So one cannot call to mind, for example, one category without invoking the negation of that category. And nothing is the antithesis of being. Nothingness, rather, is the antithesis of being. So consciousness, when we think, when we say the word being in our consciousness, consciousness, says Hegel, experiences this unity of opposites as a contradiction. Because we are, when we are invoking the concept of being, we are simultaneously invoking its negation, non-being. We, in our, in our, even in our conceptual framework, both things exist together. They cannot exist apart from each other. So in our consciousness, we, we, we experience this as a contradiction and we cannot resolve this contradiction without invoking a third category. And that third category says, Hegel is becoming. So the synthesis of being and nothingness is really becoming. What does this even mean? Well, what it means is we can go all the way back to the debate between Parmenides and Heraclitus. Uh, if you recall from my lectures or from other people's lectures, Parmenides thought the change was impossible because nothingness cannot exist. Whereas Heraclitus thought that whatever exists changes into something that it is not at that particular point in time changes into something that it is being, changes into nothingness. Nothingness changes back into being. That really is the essence of what change and motion really is. 
So everything is, nothing is ever statically either being or nothingness. In fact, everything is coming into being and passing away into nothingness. Taimur Rahman didn't exist before, well, 1975. And may not exist after a certain point in time. I don't know what that point in time will be. So does Taimur Rahman exist? If I ask that question, you know, outside of the framework of time, no answer can be given. Because there was a time when he didn't exist, then there was a time that he did exist, that is, I did exist, and there will be a time that I will not exist. So what do I say? Do I exist? Do I not exist? No, the, 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 the way to look at it would be that, um, uh, that Temur Rahman or humanity or a human being is constantly in a process of coming into being and then passing away. And that process is called by Hegel becoming. So everything in, the, or everything in nature, not just life, but everything in even those things that are inanimate, that are part of nature, are constantly coming into being and passing away. So what does this apply about Aristotle's uh, tautological law of identity? What it implies is, when we say being is equal to being, what we are looking at is only one static point in time. The, the fact is that in reality, being, being is always transforming into nothingness. Nothingness is always transforming back into being. And this is a continuous development process, dialectical development, which he refers to as becoming. So what he has tried to show by this is that the categories of the mind, even those that we consider to be the most stable, such as just existence, being, are in fact unstable. And if such a concept as being is unstable, all the other concepts that we can think about, such as tables and chairs and horses and donkeys and dogs, etc., are also unstable. So you see the dialectic now here. Being is of itself. Life is out of itself. And the mind is in and for itself. This is what Hegel refers to as the Geist, uh, the spirit, the mind. Just put a pin in that particular thought that somehow logic transforms into nature and nature is mediated by something that um, Hegel refers to as the mind, as the spirit, as the Geist. Uh, what that means exactly, we will come back to when we examine Hegel's philosophy of history. Next up, we have essence. What is an essence? It's um, something different from, from being. Being is existence without pointing out to what particularly exists. Whereas essence is pointing to the qualities of a given object. A table has a certain essence because it is something that you can write on or put things on. A chair has a certain essence because, well, you can sit on a chair. Now this sets up the idea that essence points to certain qualities of an object, sets up the contradiction between what is objective and what is subjective logic. By objective logic, Hegel means the physical properties of which something is made up of. And by subjective logic, Hegel means our concept of that particular object or of the or our concepts of the physical properties of that particular object. So there is a dialectical contradiction here as well that uh, there are there is a thing in itself as Kant would have put it its physical properties and our concept about the thing in itself and this is constantly in contradiction with each other. This subject object dialectic between subjective logic and objective logic, what exists in our mind and what exists in reality is also another level of dialectical contradiction that is resolved or worked out only in philosophy. So we see here that Hegel's conception of an unchanging essence is also made problematic by Hegel. First the idea of being was made problematic, now the idea of stable unchanging essences is made problematic by Hegel. Essences, says Hegel, are always changing, always developing, always coming into being and passing away. They are not static at all, but dialectical. Our ideas of what is good or bad or right or just or rational, even our ideas of what is part of nature or what is not part of nature, all our ideas or ideas of what is nature, all our ideas are undergoing a transformation. So the essences that are the central organizing principles, uh, the conceptual structure behind any material object is never stable. A 
according to Hegel. And Plato is quite wrong in thinking that these essences are unchanging. Now, how does Hegel relate this idea of logic to nature? Logic is in the highest level of abstraction. It is in the metaphysical realm, as I said, according to Hegel. It is not, logic is not something material. Logic is something almost in a certain sense, ideal, immaterial or metaphysical. But what about nature? Nature is the opposite of logic. Nature is manifested in the material. In nature, Hegel says, the idea has lost itself because it has lost its unity and is splintered into all the different things that we see in nature. What does Hegel mean here? Well, you can, well if you look around at nature, you see there are many different animals, there are many different plants, there are different continents. If there is so much incredible diversity in nature. So whatever logic gave rise to everything that we see in nature must have been splintered into all the various manifestations of nature that we see. Yet Hegel says the idea has merely concealed its unity. It's not that the unity doesn't exist. It's not apparent to us that the logic of the weather cycle is the same as the logic of history. Who would even think such a thing? That the cycle of uh, life and death and rebirth and so on is the same as, philo as, as the development of thought or philosophy. That is a really strange idea. That the logic of how a tree grows is the same as the logic of how a child evolves. A really very, very, very strange idea. But that is fundamentally what Hegel believes. That, that the way in which nature unfolds itself, the logic of nature is one and the same. Even though apparently all the different things seem to function in different ways. But in fact, there is one logic that they all obey. And so in nature, logic, Hegel says, is splintered and appears to us to have, uh, you know, to be in, to not be united, not be one notion, one logic, but to be splintered into so many different, different kinds of systems. But Hegel says that nature really reveals itself as so many successful attempts of the idea to emerge from the state of otherness and present itself to us. In other words, when we look at how nature evolves, whether we are looking at the weather cycle or we are looking at history or the evolution of thought, in every single instant, whether we are looking at the evolution of a plant or the development of a child, in every single instant nature is presenting to us its logic, the, its fundamental unifying logic. Mind, says Hegel, is therefore the goal of nature. What does this mean even? That nature is presenting to us the logic that give rise and animates all the spirit, everything that you see in nature. Whatever is in nature is realized in a higher form in the mind, which also emerges from nature. So our mind, all the minds of humanity are attempt, attempting to grasp the logic of nature. And our mind is part of that nature and is formed from that nature. So here we have a subject attempting to understand the logic of an object but the logic of the subject is the same as the logic of the object. And so the subject-object dialectic can only come together in the mind that can grasp both these, the unity of nature and logic. Life, therefore, is proof of dialectics. There, I can say a lot more about uh, the dialectics of nature or how nature reveals the dialectic in its development etc but let's put a pin in that as well uh, i won't return to it in this lecture but i'll try and return to it in a subsequent lecture now what does hegel say about the philosophy of history of course that is the most interesting part of hegel because that directly applies to politics and economics and culture and ideas and society and historical development and how we see humanity, how we see the past and how we see ourselves in the present, how we see ourselves in the future. So what does Hegel say about this? Well, let's first situate Hegel himself in the context of Germany. I like to think of what was going on in Germany in the time of Hegel and uh, before him as well as the German French Revolution, 
by which I mean that the changes that were intellectual and class changes that were that were the cause of the French Revolution also had an impact of course on Germany. It's not the French Revolution that is necessarily having an impact on Germany, although that it did of course with the Napoleonic invasion. But even more broadly, the changes that are coming about across Europe in the intellectual life of Europe will be felt in Germany in a different way than they were felt in France. Hegel starts his book, The Phenomenology of Mind, with the passage, the spirit of man has broken with the old order of things. Now this is really an invitation to think about Germany as having, specifically Germany, as having thrown off all the older ideas and having embraced new ideas. What were these new ideas? The French Revolution occurs in the, obviously in the context of Germany, which at that time is not as advanced economically and in other ways as France is. And so the German French Revolution, in my opinion, remains at the level really of philosophy and ideology. It gives a rise to what we would consider uh, largely a reformist movement in, in the realm of politics. It doesn't give rise to a revolution of the sort that we see, saw in France, but it does give rise to what we would call German idealism as one of the products of, of um, this age of modernity that hits Germany in the 18th and 19th century. So German idealism begins in 1780s, in the 1780s, and we can see that it continues all the way through till the 1840s. So the great figures of German idealism are Immanuel Kant and Fichte and uh, Schelling, and really German idealism, in my opinion, culminates in the Hegelian system. The context of German idealism is the great debate between the continental rationalists and the um, English and Scottish empiricists. Um, but the, what unites all the German idealists is that they all attempted to create a general system of philosophy that would be derived from certain first principles, certain absolutes. Uh, which would precede all the principles which are conditioned by the difference between one principle and another. So certain first absolute principles ordered every other difference that we saw, uh, every other system that we saw. And you can see the influence of this in Marx's Capital who begins by unpacking the commodity form and then tries to relate the commodity form to every single different aspect of the capitalist mode of production. Let's first try and understand the debate between the rationalists and the empiricists. The rationalists such as, you know, Descartes and Spinoza, Leibniz, etc. thought that knowledge is based on ideas that the mind arrives at deductively on its own. That all we require to gain knowledge is to think about uh, those uh, deductively about the concepts that we already have present and to see as Socrates saw how they contradict each other, whether they contradict each other and what that implies about what we know about the world. Empiricists on the other hand thought that all knowledge really comes from perception of actual objects through our senses, through our five senses and that therefore all knowledge was based on sense perception. You see here that the rationalists basically privileged reason, deductive logic and intuition over sensation and experience. And they regarded almost all or most ideas as innate rather than coming from outside. That the mind already had access to all the ideas it required in order to think about the outside world. And what we needed to do with those concepts was to think about them deductively, clearly. Uh, rationalism therefore emphasized certain rather than merely probable knowledge as the goal of inquiry. They, want, they, under, they thought that deductive logic leads to certain conclusions that cannot be logic reach, leads to certain conclusions that are irrefutable. These are iron conclusions of deductive logic. Whereas they criticized empiricists on the grounds that uh, observation would lead to conclusions that would be probable but they would not be ironclad laws such as we find in mathematics or perhaps even in physics. So it was premised upon certain views such as the fact that substance is real, substance has an underlying principle of unity 
and that underlying principle of unity there to be found in substance is understandable, graspable by the human mind. Empiricists, on the other hand, thought that knowledge is a posteriori. Sense experience is our only source of ideas. They rejected deduction and innate knowledge. The mind is a tabla rasa. In other words, it's a blank slate. Everything that we know about the world, we know only through our five senses. Therefore, they relied on the inductive methods of inquiry. They wanted to see whether things correlate with each other, whether when we drop an object, whether it falls, etc., what happens to it. The rationalists on the criticism of empiricism, that empiricists cannot give certain knowledge, is from the point of view of the empiricists, its main advantageous quality. Because the empiricists conclude that we do not know it all and that there is always some level of doubt in whatever conclusions we come to. We can only ever come to probable conclusions, never to certain conclusions. Now, in the midst of all this, we have a figure, a very great figure, one of the great figures of Western European philosophy. We have Immanuel Kant. He wanted to synthesize rationalism and empiricism on the one hand, but also on the other hand, he wanted to come up with a system which could reconcile the great scientific advances of his period, particularly those made by Newton, with the idea of free will, with uh, what was dear to him from within religion. He thought that science was overly deterministic uh, in such a way that it negated human free will, but there must be some room left for that. So these are the big debates that Immanuel Kant was trying to address, and he resolved them in his own mind or in his work with the central idea of transcendental idealism. Transcendental idealism posited a distinction between what we can experience of the natural world and what we cannot experience, that is God, our soul, the metaphysical transcendental realm, etc. We can only have knowledge of things we experience. One cannot know the thing in itself, though, said Kant. What does this mean? Well, what he's saying over here is that there is such a thing as an object outside of ourselves, but we really don't have access to whatever exists outside of ourselves because all we have access to are the empirical sensations that we feel. So all we have real access to, all our mind really has access to, is the image of that concept made within our mind with the help of our empirical senses. In other words, when I look at you, what I'm looking at is not you per se, but an image of you that is formed within my mind. So now Kant ends up dividing what we can and what we cannot understand into three important categories. First are those things that he calls analytic a priori statements, such as mathematics. One plus one will always be two. Reason can understand such analytic a priori statements because these statements rely on definitions. They are definitionally true. The definition of one is and two is such that one plus one will always be equal to two. Secondly, are statements that we understand or knowledge that we gain through our sense perception. This is basically what Kant refers to as synthetic a, prior, a posteriori statements or knowledge. These are things of pure observation. For example, if I say that I'm wearing a bluish shirt today, this is a statement of observation. I cannot make that statement without observing what color my shirt is. Um, so this is where the empiricists sort of play an important role and their theory of induction or their method of induction rather plays a very important role. But now, what about statements that require a bit of both? What about forms of knowledge that require on the one hand things like mathematics and things that are definitionally true, concepts that are definitionally true, together with observations about the natural world? These are the most difficult things. Uh, Kant says to really grasp and understand. This is what he refers to as synthetic a priori statements. These are things like Newton's laws of motion because they are deductively true but also they are referring to the empirical world. 
So how does one explain such synthetic a priori forms of knowledge? How does this really work? Kant says that in order to understand the world as it exists outside of ourselves, remember we have no access to the world that exists outside of ourselves. We only have access to images of the world that exists outside of ourselves, images within our mind. To comprehend those experiences, those images, etc. For example, the eye catches a two-dimensional image at the back of the retina. It's only the mind that transforms that two-dimensional image into a three-dimensional uh, space. How is this possible? asks Kant. He says the comprehension of experience is not possible without cert certain innate concepts that assist and help in ordering our sense perception. Now that's fascinating. In other words, the mind is not merely receiving information. It is ordering that information. But how would it order that information? On what basis will it order that information? The basis on which it orders that information is something that we have not learnt, that we have not got from experience because we wouldn't have known how to organize experience without certain innate knowledge of how to organize sense perception. So how did we learn to organize sense perception? We were born with it. The mind was born with it. The mind has certain innate categories of thought which it utilizes to organize sense perception. What are those? Well, there are four different categories. First is our innate ideas of quantity. These include things like unity, plurality and totality. Second are our innate ideas of quality. These include things like reality, negation, limitation. Thirdly, we have our ideas of modality. This includes inherence and sub subsistence and causality and dependence and community. And finally, we have our innate ideas of relations. We have our ideas of possibility and impossibility. We have our innate ideas of existence and non-existence. And we have innate ideas of necessity and contingency. These are the core ideas that we are born with that help us understand and organize our sense perception. So now that I've elaborated some of the intellectual philosophical context in which Hegel begins to develop his ideas, I think we'll take a break at this particular point in time, keep this lecture short or rather divide this lecture into two parts so that you can absorb it. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like and comment and share. These are some incredibly hard lectures and I've worked uh, very hard for this particular lecture. In fact, uh, it's really, you know, uh, producing a lecture of this quality is a culmination of decades of work studying people like Immanuel Kant and Hegel and many others. So do share this lecture and like and subscribe on my channel. And just keep this in your mind that what we've understood about Hegel is that Hegel wants to explain the entire universe through one idea, and that idea is the dialectic. He wants to say everything is ordered according to the dialectic. And the idea behind the dialectic is, of course, that everything develops through an internal contradiction. Everything is constantly in motion. And he wants to problematize the old categories of logic, uh, specifically Aristotle's idea of uh, law of identity, an idea that things could be understood through their essences. He wants to problematize essence. He wants to problematize the idea that being is stable. He wants to then problematize even Kant's idea that the thing in itself cannot be understood, but rather we have certain innate ideas through which we understand our sense experiences. That was Kant's great synthesis between the rationalists and the empiricists that we have certain empirical knowledge and we have certain innate ideas and it's only the synthesis, the dialectical intermingling of both these that gives rise to, you know, our ability to, to understand the world and make our way through the world. That's great. That's Kant's great synthesis of rationalism and, and empiricism. But Hegel is going to upset that entire cart as well and how he does that we will talk about, I will talk about in the next lecture. Thanks a lot.